Hey, so Woodruff here. We're going to start going into another long lecture. We're getting into our third section, um, which is where we kind of have a hodgepodge of topics where we have ear and eye disorders, we have musculoskeletal disorders, and neurological disorders. So we're going to go into my least favorite topic. Anyone who knows me, my most favorite topic is cardiac. My least favorite topic is ears and eyes, mostly because I find them boring and um, <laughs> they're just kind of a necessity. It's not something, but most of these we don't even see people on the hospital with these. These are mostly managed on an outpatient basis. However, you're going to have a lot of patients that might have a history of these disorders. So it's very important to kind of see how they re interact with, you know, other beautiful disorders like cardiac disorders and things like that. So um, this first lecture is going to be over ear and eye disorders. Keep in mind that um, all of um, this lecture is a long lecture. So if you're looking for short, sweet, simple videos, you know, go under my med search playlist under unit three and you'll find um, shorter videos related to this. Um, so anyway, let's get started. So first, before we can talk about disorders, we need to talk about what's normal or what's expected for the eye. Um, so what's normal or expected for the eye, it's expected that the, uh, you know, the visual acuity or how well a person can see is going to be 20-20. And I'm not going to go deep into what that means, but effectively, it's just that like your vision, like what you're seeing um, at a certain level is equal to what you should be seeing, like how the distance that you, how far, like if it was you know, 20 feet away, that's how far that, you know, most people can see certain things at that same level that, and anyway, I'm not going to get into the depth of it because I hate eyes. <laughs> Needless to say, visual acuity is all about how well you can see. Um, uh, double vision um, should not be present. There should be no drainage uh, present from the eye, um, the conjunctiva or the, um, uh, what do you call it, um, area kind of under the lid there should be clear. Um, the sclera uh, should be white, which is the white part of your eye. Your lens should be clear. There shouldn't be any cloudiness there. We should have perla and perla stands for that pupils are equal and reactive to light and accommodation. Um, and um, what that means is, is, you know, when I shine a light into um, someone's pupils, their pupils should constrict because pupils constrict to light. So the pupils should get um, be, have, be larger and go to a smaller size um, when light is um, entering them, which is why we usually want to do this test with the lights turned down to really see how they're interacting. Because if I already have lights on, especially bright lights on, it's going to be harder to tell that difference. And um, the last part is that they're, um, they're reactive to light in accommodation. And accommodation is, is that, you know, like usually people put a pen far away and then bring it close to the eye and there should be a change in the pupils as well there. I'll be honest though, as a nurse, I don't know if I have ever um, really checked a patient for accommodation because, you know, in, in real life and even being an ICU nurse, um, you know, a lot of patients, it's harder to do accommodation on and um, it's hard enough to do Perla on <laughs> some patients. Um, but, um, you know, so I usually say I have Pearl on my patients. <laughs> There's the ah uh, is not there, um, but most patients it's harder to do. And um, if they're having a good reaction to light, it's usually a, a positive enough sign where you don't need to do those further assessments. Um, you also, um, a part of an uh, eye assessment would be extraocular movements. So that's like seeing their eye movement, the actual ability to move their orbit around in different directions, like kind of the following the finger thing, um, seeing that they can move at their eyes in all different directions. So let's talk first about the first kind of problem we can have with vision, which would be what are called refractive errors, also known as vision loss. Um, so there's a couple terms here that you'd want to know. The first one's going to be what's called myopia, or this is what's called nearsightedness. And this is the most common thing. Like most people, when they say that, hey, they have glasses or they have a vision issues, they usually have myopia. And this is nearsighted. And so when, when it says nearsighted, that's what I can see. So um, in, in myopia, I always think I can see myself, but I can't see far away. So these are people that have trouble seeing things at a distance that, you know, if you have a friend who has myopia, and they're driving you, they better have their glasses or their contacts on, they shouldn't be driving you. Um, and so um, they have trouble seeing far away, whereas hyperopia is a farsightedness. So in other words, they can see far away just fine. But when, you know, they're trying to look up close at something they can't see. And then there's presbyopia, which is where, you know, as we get older, we um, have a loss of vision. Um, you know, so that's just, um, you know, telling you like, okay, the cause of the vision loss is going to be age. 
And then um, on top of having issues with either seeing far away or seeing close up, people can also have what's called astigmatism, which is a blurriness. And it's blurry no matter what the distance is. So it's kind of like um, you know a blurriness that's around the edges of objects. And so um, this is really common. So some people that have myopia may also have astigmatism or hyperopia can have astigmatism as well. And if you're lucky, you know, you could be a double winner or a triple winner. Um, so, you know, overall, what am I trying to achieve with this patient? You know, I'm trying to help them to have better vision. Um, so um, of, uh, often what the, the easiest way or the least invasive thing is to, you know, have a corrective lens, whether that's through glasses, um, like reading glasses, um, especially if they have the hyperopia, they might have reading glasses just for seeing up close. Um, some people have trouble with both seeing far away and up close. They may need things called bifocals, which allows them to see both far away and up close. Uh, most people today get contact lenses, they have more comfort, um, uh, but the thing to keep in mind is you're sticking your finger, in which usually our hands are dirtiest, uh, one of the dirtiest areas of our body, um, and putting it in your eye, which um, should be a fairly clean place, so there are definitely certain care practices that you need to teach your patients, which I'll talk about. Um, Many people today are also going for a procedure that's called LASIK. You've probably heard of it. This is where effectively they use a laser to sculpt the cornea to correct the air where there's the air where the patient's not, um, they're not being able to see, see well or having that vision loss. So they're actually using a laser to correct that. Um, some people are even having what's called lens transplants, which is where we're taking out the person's own lens and um, uh, what do you call it, um, placing in front of like, uh, you know, pretty much like think of it like they're calling it an implantable contact lens, but they're taking um, the patient's own lens and then placing a new one in, in front of the patient's lens. Um, and so kind of like it says here, it's like pretty much having a contact, a permanent contact lens that you never take out. So when we talk about all vision, um, not only just vision, but all um, ear and eye problems, a lot of it comes down to safety and the issue is gonna be about safety. So we wanna make sure that as the nurse, we are utilizing adequate lighting for this patient. We are decreasing any hazards in their environment, re uh, reducing the amount of clutter in the environment. We're gonna verbalize actions um, to support the patient's vision loss. And what I mean by that is, um, you know, kind of letting the patient know what we're doing or what they should be doing, um, you know, kind of really talk them through things if they have decreased vision this is a fun activity you can do um you know like sit there and you know it's kind of like if you <laughs> if you blindfolded someone that you cared about and then try to give them directions of how to get somewhere like i know it doesn't need to be that extreme when you're talking to a patient because i mean sometimes they're not completely blind but i know for me when um uh what do you call it when i'm in the eye doctor's office i have horrible vision <laughs> it's gotten even worse since covid um and i'm um, doing a lot of online stuff and stuff like that and sadly with this youtube channel making a lot of videos is looking at a computer screen a lot has definitely gotten worse but um, needless to say you know when you go into the every eye doctor is, is a little bit different but they usually take me to one room have me take my contacts out and then have me walk to another room to go get the like glaucoma testing and other things and i know for me like i can barely walk <laughs> to that other room without like if there's luckily the, the office i'm at now is really small and there's like literally like maybe five steps in between each room um, but i've been other places where i had to go down a hallway and so i've now learned that i need to bring my glasses with me um, because I literally cannot see because sometimes some of the people have been gray and we're like oh it's this way but sometimes they, they they'll just up and leave and they'll be like it's right across the hallway and I'm like do you know I can't see <laughs> so yeah so you just want to verbalize like where to go or how to handle things um, education wise like I said um, you know hygiene so important so they need to wash their hands before they're putting their contacts and taking good care of those lens and their glasses knowing when how often they need to replace their lenses etc uh, protect uh, providing protection for the eye you know, sunglasses and things like that. It's going to be super key for these patients. Um, and then, um, you know, things like what I'm doing, like these glasses that I'm wearing, these are not for style or for comfort or for vision. Um, they're those fun blue light glasses that help so that I'm not um, getting as much of that intense light from the computer screen. Um, there's also other optical devices for people that have, especially that hyperopia where they can't see up close, like things like e-readers or like, you know, most of the time now you can uh, change the font size on a lot of um, e-books and things like that. So uh, making it a little bit easier to read. 
So now let's get into cataracts. So um, what are cataracts? So I told you before that something that's abnormal to have in an assessment for a patient is going to be having a cloudy lens. And so um, this is an opacity like you can see in this lens. It's a very cloudiness to the lens. It's something you can see. Um, it can be in one eye or it can be in both. And um, it's usually related to age, but other things like trauma, too much exposure to sunlight and diabetes are also risk factors. Um, they're gonna, patients gonna come in and complain like, hey, I'm not seeing as well. They may say that they're not seeing colors specifically as well. And they may complain of a glare, especially it's gonna be worse at night. So these patients are not gonna wanna drive at night or have some um, greater difficulty seeing at night. So what do we do to improve their vision? Um, overall, what we do is, um, uh, what do you call it? If, we can manage it one of two ways. So we can either do a conservative treatment or we can do a more invasive surgical treatment. Um, some patients, especially based on their age and their own comfort, and uh, you know, the surgery is not that invasive, but most people don't want their eyeball cut into or <laughs> don't really like that. It terrifies the crap out of me, but uh, you know, so I kind of get it. But some patients, they're, they're not too concerned or they just modify their lifestyle. Um, and what they can do is they can just keep going up on your eyewear prescription. So as your eye, um, as your vision gets worse, they can increase your prescription so that you can and still see well enough, um, use of magnifiers to be able to see things. And then sometimes, like I said, just lifestyle changes. Like, hey, if you see worse at night, then don't drive at night. For some people that, that works. Um, uh, most people will go and get some sort of incision and removal of the cataract. And as you can see in this um, picture, they literally go and cut out and um, remove that cataract um, so the patient can see again. Um, so we're going to talk about this particular procedure, but a lot of the um, post-operative eye surgery stuff is going to be the same. So kind of keep this in mind. Um, you know, a lot of times in order to access the eye, the best they um, do things to dilate and open um, the eye, um, you know, in order to uh, best, you know, get to what they're trying to do. So a lot of times after the procedure, their eyes are still dilated, which means like, remember how I said, normally when light comes in, your eyes constrict. If your eyes can't do that because you were given medications or drops that are affected that um, it can be really hard light can be so overwhelming so you want to keep the light stem um, we want to make sure that um, we teach them about signs and symptoms of infection and hand hygiene because there was an incision made um, they need to know how to take eye drops and um, most people don't really know how to do eye drops um, where they're supposed to be placed etc um, so you want to make sure that they kind of know the general procedure. And then, um, you know, the one thing is, is that like, you always want to put your, um, they always want to put their finger on the inside and put pressure in this inner canthus thing, um, that, um, will prevent it from like any medicine from being systemically absorbed, um, or it'll decrease the risk of it being absorbed. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, they may have an eye patch uh, on their affected eye um, because they're, uh, and it, just know that if a patient has um, an eye patch on that their depth perception is going to be off, so they're going to be high risk for falls, so help and assist them uh, maybe getting from place to place and watch them closely. And then um, for all eye surgeries, we want to avoid things that are going to increase our IOP, which is our intraocular pressure, so we're going to tell them to avoid bending, stooping, coughing, and lifting. Um, overall prevention for these patients, um, so suggest that they wear sunglasses, avoid any unnecessary radiation, um, and um, uh, vitamin C and vitamin E are super important for eye health. Yeah. All right, moving on to more serious things. Let's talk about retinal detachment. This is considered an emergency. So as you're breaking down and trying to differentiate these different eye disorders, it's really helpful to think about which ones are just like, hey, this is a, you know, a chronic or a manageable disorder and which ones do I need to do something right now as the nurse? So this is considered an emergency. And what's happening here is the retina is actually detaching from the blood vessels in the back of the eye, which leads to zero oxygen and nutrients to the eye. Um, and so obviously that's why this is an emergency because um, lack of blood flow um, is definitely no bueno. Um, it can be caused, it can happen spontaneously. Um, you can get holes in your retina and then they can end up with a tear. And most people find this terrifying that this can happen because <laughs> it sounds really painful, but believe it or not, it's not actually painful. Um, and it also can be associated with aging. Um, and so, um, 
uh, what do you call it, the other risk factors aside from increasing age. Um, if you have really, really severe myopia, remember that's that um, nearsightedness where you can see up close, but you can't see far away. Any sort of eye trauma can put you at risk for it. Um, having cataract surgery. So those patients that have that cataract surgery, the manipulation of the eye can put you more at risk. And then having a family or a personal history. So like, for example, if I had a retinal detachment on my left eye, I would need to be taught the signs of a retinal detachment on the right, my right. Uh, so for my right eye, because I can have another, I can have retinal detachment again, or it can come in the other side. So in other words, once I have it once, I'm at a higher chance of getting it again, probably because I have lots of risk factors for it. Um, so what do they complain about it? Um, something to keep in mind is not all tears or holes lead to detachment. So just because someone has a tear or hole doesn't mean that they're actually fully detached. And I asked a, an eye doctor about this once because I had a time that, you know, I swore like after and I didn't realize it until after I started teaching because I knew nothing about eyes because they're disgusting. Um, but, um, you know, I was asking about that. I had like some similar some of these symptoms one night when I was attacked before I became a nurse. I asked about it and, you know, I was like, man, but like, I mean, I still got my vision. So like what happened? And he's like, oh, well, listen, he's like, it's think of it like a plug. So, you know, sometimes like you have a plug in the wall and it's kind of loose in the wall. And so like whatever it's plugged into is kind of like going on and off or like, you know, kind of um, it's like loose or kind of, um, you know, you kind of see those sparks in the plug, you know, where it, it's, it's like starting to get electricity, but not quite. And he said, that's pretty much what happened. I had a loose plug, but it got plugged back in. And so this is just to say that just because there's tears or holes doesn't mean that it's going to completely detach. Um, but so before it detaches, there's no pain with this. All they're going to usually have is what are called light flashes or photophosia, where there's just kind of these like kind of think of them like little fireworks um, in their eyes and across their field of vision. They also can have what looks like a cobweb or a hairnet in their field of vision. Um, after the, it detaches, they have a painless, remember no pain with this, um, loss of vision. It looks like a curtain going across their field of vision. Uh, so how do we treat it? So this is a perfusion issue. There's a, um, a detachment which leads to a complete loss of flow to your eye. So we um, usually do emergent procedures to um, restore that. Now you don't have to know these in depth, at least if you're at my school. <laughs> so, um, but I'm um, just understanding some of the things you're going to need to do as a nurse. So don't study too hard of exactly what is this or how does this work. But I'll tell you, you know, effectively like the scleral buckling. That's like where they literally put like a belt around your eyeball to keep that tear closed. They where they repair it. And the intravitreal bubble is where they put a, um, a bubble on the outside around the tear. And it puts kind of like um, pressure to keep the eyeball closed, um, like that tear closed on the eyeball. Um, and so um, overall, you know, depending on the procedure, they may have activity restrictions, like in this picture, um, this woman's lying face down. And so like when they have the bubble, they like them to be face down and they're supposed to be face down. And usually it's for a few weeks um, in this position, as much as they can throughout the day, like, you know, almost all day long, they're supposed to be in this position. Luckily, you can maybe get something down there to watch or something to do. Um, but they need to be under that to best keep that um, tear where um, tear from reopening. Um, they're going to probably need protective eyewear. And then um, the general education. And of course, like all the other stuff I said about like, avoiding any sort of things that are going to increase my intraocular pressure. Definitely want to do that. And then general education is just teaching them signs and symptoms because they have that really high risk of uh, the eye, the other eye detaching. All right. So now let's go into our last eye disorder, which is glaucoma. And we have, you know, there's really two types of glaucoma here. Um, there's acute and chronic glaucoma, and they of course have multiple names because we have to be complicated. So let's kind of uh, break this down. Um, so uh, with glaucoma, you know, overall the issue here is there's too much pressure. Um, there's like, there's fluid in your eyeball that regularly drains um, and kind of keeps like a balance in your eye. It's what's called aqueous humor, or aqueous fluid. Um, and so um, what happens sometimes is that this fluid's not able to drain or you're producing too much. Um, and if that happens, it puts pressure on your eye, which pushes it back. And, and remember I said all those blood vessels and nerves are in the back of your eye. And so that extra pressure can lead to complete vision loss and de degeneration of that nerve that's in the back of your eyeball. Um, so this is considered the second leading cause of blindness, um, but it is very preventable if it's detected early, which is why we get that fun test when we go to the eye doctor um, that everyone loves so much. So think of this like eyeball ischemia or an eyeball attack or blockage where it's completely blocking off that blood vessel from the extra pressure. 
Uh, and it's all about that balance of fluid, like I mentioned, that aqueous fluid. It's either, like I said, there's um, uh, I'm producing too much or um, there's something blocking because there's this very like there's this angle, which is what we're going to talk about soon, where that fluid um, gets released. And um, what do you call it? If that fluid um, if that fluid is unable to get released, that's where it builds up. And so it's just this accumulation of fluid and it has nowhere to go. So all it can do is push back. Um, so there's what's called open angle um, or uh, chronic glaucoma, and then there's angle closure or acute um, glaucoma. And so open angle, think it's more open. Um, there's a little bit of room still for drainage um, or chronic glaucoma. It's more common. Um, it's not as dangerous, but definitely needs treatment. And then there's angle closure. The angle is completely closed um, or um, there's an acute closure of this um, of my angle that's allowing for drainage of my eyeball fluid. So you might be able to visualize it better here. Um, so open angle, um, there is still, um, it's maybe clogged and not draining as well, um, but there's still some room for drainage out of this um, eyeball hole that's allowing for aqueous, uh, aqueous drainage of that fluid. Um, whereas with closed angle or, or um, acute glaucoma, um, they have a complete blocked um, ability to drain that aqueous fluid. So um, open angle usually it just develops since it's chronic, it develops slowly. There's usually no symptoms at first. And then eventually they have tunnel vision where they can't see anything in their peripheral vision. They can only see like straight ahead of themselves. Um, whereas the acute angle closure glaucoma, um, this is going to be the only eye disorder that I've talked about that's going to have pain. So if you want to kind of remember what's different about this one for acute angle closure glaucoma, it's the only eye disorder that I talked about that's going to have pain. There's no pain in retinal detachment. There's no pain in cataracts, except after they have surgery, they might have some pain, but in general, no pain with cataracts, no pain with retinal detachment, no pain with vision loss, but there is pain with acute angle closure glaucoma. Um, they also, of course, because there's that sudden pressure, it can have nausea, vomiting, and they can also have colored halos around lights as from all that excess pressure on their optic nerve. So treatment, um, you know, of course, for acute is going to be, this is an emergency. So um, we need to reduce that intraocular pressure fast or find a way to um, get that drained. So um, usually what they do is they need to create a new opening in the iris to allow for the drainage of that aqueous fluid. Um, here's some names of some procedures that they do to help with that. And then they also commonly give medications to decrease how much aqueous fluid you're making or to help it to drain better. Um, so that, uh, what do you Caught, there is some medications that can be used for that. Um, and then, uh, and I'm not going deep into a lot of those medications because, um, you know, there's a lot of eye medications. I'm really going to focus on the major ones that, um, you know, are really important. We mostly focus on the chronic ones. Um, we also, of course, for this patient want to maintain their vision so that early detection and treatment is key because a lot of patients have chronic and it becomes acute. So it's, it's really recognizing that chronic early. Um, and um, uh, as they're being treated for this, we need to do regular visual acuity checks because they can lose their vision as a result of this. So then chronic open angle glaucoma. Um, you know, my goal here is really to have stable intraocular pressure. So this is kind of a chronic issue um, that, you know, a slow buildup of, you know, where they're either collecting too much or not able to drain. So um, pretty much the treatments are, you know, if they need surgical intervention, there are interventions that can be done to allow for better drainage. But most of these patients are managed just with um, eye drop medications like, um, uh, what do you call it? Um, uh, we got, I'm just trying to think of the, not the name, but like the, because it's, I want to say, it's usually Timolol. I want to say it's Timolol. I could be lying. Um, that's the uh, eye drop for beta blockers. And um, there's also alpha adrenergic agonists, so alpha and beta blockers. And if you remember, the one great thing about, or not great thing, the one okay thing about eyes is that you have to use a cardiovascular medication. Um, but um, you know, there are other medications that can be used to decrease the amount of aqueous fluid or to increase the amount of outflow. But really the two that we want you to focus on for my school is just alpha and beta blocker eye drops. 
Um, so we need to teach them regular eye exams to especially to see for those changes in their vision and other things, especially in that peripheral vision that may be a sign that their glaucoma is progressing. They need to teach them medication education side effects, how to take the eye drops correctly. And then especially you have to think alpha and beta blockers, these are eye drops. So they shouldn't be incredibly systemically absorbed, but they can be, especially if they're not um, you know, applied correctly. So we definitely want them to check their blood pressure and their heart rate before. And if their heart rate's less than 60 for those beta blockers, they are not gonna take their um, glaucoma drops. Um, and like I mentioned, how to administer that. So yeah. All right. So now let's get into the ear. We're halfway there. Um, so what's normal in the ears? The ears should be symmetrical. And fun fact, if there is any fun facts about ears and eyes, this would be it, um, is that the, each ear um, to each individual is, uh, is unique in that it's like a fingerprint, that like your ear is only unique to you. No one else has the same ear as you do. Um, like, so the shape and the contour and all that stuff. So check out your cool new fingerprint if you haven't yet to see how your cool ear that you didn't realize was its own unique shape. Um, so, um, other things that are normal is they shouldn't have any tenderness or lesions there. The canal itself should be clear. The tympanic membrane should be intact. It should not be ruptured. And you should be able to hear a low whisper at 30 centimeters. So um, first let's talk about if we have hearing loss. So the most preventable cause of hearing loss is noise. And we have live in a very noisy world. Um, so, you know, aside from the things that we purposefully, um, you know, are subjecting ourselves to like, you know, like loud music almost, I mean, how, if you walk down a busy street, you know, count how many people have the earbuds in, you'd be surprised. And I'm not, I'm not judging because I'm one of them. Um, but um, yeah, a lot of people with the earbuds, is it's going to be interesting to see how hearing loss changes as people are using the AirPods and stuff like that so much more often. Um, but noise is the, what is called the most preventable cause of hearing loss. And if we can avoid it, we of course want to use ear protection. We also want to avoid things that can be toxic to the ears, like ototoxic drugs. And those are going to be things like aspirin, loop diuretics. There's a lot of antibiotics like gentamicin and things like that can be toxic to the ears. Um, and when I say administer properly, like loop diuretics are only toxic to the ears when they're pushed too fast, IV push. Um, so it's just making sure, you know, we're, we're always in a rush, it seems, as nurses. And some nurses are going to say, oh, you don't need to push that slowly. But um, from someone, you know, who um, has seen this actually happen, um, uh, we cut it. It's definitely not something that um, you ever want to look back and be like, man, if I just would have taken a little bit more time. So um, if something says push over two minutes or push over five minutes, whatever, uh, make sure you follow in those directions. Um, general education, we want to teach them um, how to use hearing devices. So if they have a hearing aid, they need to change their batteries about every, they usually last about every three up to 22 days, depending on how much they're being used, et cetera. Um, so how to change the batteries, when to change them. When they first get them, they shouldn't just, you know, start like going out into a crowded room. They should start with progressive exposure, like um, uh, smaller or quieter noises at first. Um, when they're not being worn, we want to keep them in a dry, cool area in order to um, uh, prevent them from have, um, having damage or breaking down. And I'll tell you, people lose their hearing aids all the time in the hospital. It's one of the most common things that hospitals end up having to replace. Sorry. Let's turn it off. Um, that hospitals end up having to replace is um, uh, what do you call it? Um, the hearing aids. So make sure to log those. Those are super expensive and hard to get because they're specialized for the person to fit into their ear. Um, so be careful when you um, have them in the hospital or helping someone with them. Um, they should be cleaned weekly and as needed, just depending. And then, of course, there's alternative communication techniques too. things like um, patients can learn how to read lips. They can um, learn sign language. There's a lot of technical devices that can be used. Um, and then with severe hearing loss, a cochlear implant may be considered. So um, how can I support communication for this patient? So this is a commonly misunderstood that people think you have to talk louder. And sometimes a patient may ask you to talk louder, but you're not, um, 
per nursing school, <laughs> you know, what we're supposed to do is speak normally and slowly, like in a normal tone. Don't exaggerate your facial expressions like, la, la, la. <laughs> I'm trying to be crazy. Um, they're they're not, um, not comprehending you. They may just not be able to hear you. So simple sentences, do not shout. Um, a lot of times it helps to talk into their good ear. So if I'm talking to someone and they're not responding, then I'm, I'm like, can you hear me? And then like, you know, um, if they tell me, oh yeah, I can hear better out of this ear, I'm not going to go and shout in that ear, but I'm going to go towards or like lean towards that side or talk to them on that side. Um, good eye contact helps so that they know you're communicating with them and reduce any distractions that may make it harder for them to understand you. So let's talk about otosclerosis. So otosclerosis is a um, hereditary disease. It is one that um, causes uh, like pretty much there's um, you probably don't know this, but in order to hear things, you have, there's this whole process. And I always, I always joke, I think on my TikTok that I have, um, I have like a, um, I was like, it should be made into a TikTok dance, but pretty much what happens is it's like, as you're hearing me, what right now there's actually, you're not, you think you're hearing my voice, but what you're hearing is actually vibrations. Vibrations go into your ear um, and they hit up against your tympanic membrane, which causes these bones to like clash together, which then goes in and then there's these little cilia and which is like, you know, little fine hairs and they uh, like wh wag back and forth and lean back and forth. And somehow that creates the noise of you hearing my voice. Um, pretty cool stuff. But in order for all that to work, I have to have these bones that have this special um, motion that they do in order to create those vibrations in those cilia. Um, and if you're watching this in a professional and I explain that horribly, I'm okay with it because this is not my specialty <laughs> and I like my explanation. It sounds pretty cool and sounds pretty accurate. I mean, from the video I watched, it was pretty accurate. So, and I think it's pretty cool, but anyway, um, so what's happening is there's a malformation or an issue in which those, the bones were formed in the ear, um, which leads to inability to hear. So when we're looking at hearing problems, you want to think about, cause the ear has, you know, two main functions. It helps with hearing and then it helps with balance. So you want to think for each of these disorders, is this a hearing problem or a balance problem or both? And so for otosclerosis, it is just a hearing problem. Um, this is the most common cause of hearing loss in young adults. Um, it usually can happen on both sides, but um, they might have like be, be able to hear better on one side versus the other. Um, so in order to diagnose this, um, they can we can do a um, otoscopic exam otoscopic, it might be the other way, I don't know. Um, and it's like kind of a reddish or blush color to the tympanic membrane. This is what's known as a swart sign. Um, and then of course they can actually look at the bones in the ear and um, they'll see the bony changes or they're not going to, um, they're not going to, there's going to be that malformation they're going to find. Uh, they also can do what's called a tuning fork test. And so, like I said, when I was talking about how, you know, vibrations go into the ear and then go through the tympanic membrane, the bones are hitting it, each other and then the cilia are doing their thing. That's what we call um, air conduction. So through the air, this is what you're hearing is the vibrations and it's becoming sound. Um, but um, that in order to have good air conduction, your bones and your ear have to be working. But there's also called bone conduction. And what they do for a tuning fork test is they, they you know, hit the tuning fork, it vibrates, and they put it right on the bone here on your skull. And by doing bone conduction, this bypasses the bones in your ear and goes straight to those, um, you know, little cilia that are doing their little dance and creates sound. So if a person can't hear through air conduction, but can hear through bone conduction, it's a really strong sign that they have a problem with the bones in their ear. Hopefully that makes sense. I know it's a little confusing. So what am I gonna do for otosclerosis? Um, I'm going to do things to improve hearing. So there's gonna be medications like sodium fluoride. Um, and hold on one second, because I've got someone here. Let me pause this and pause this recording. Sorry about that. Um, oh no, look, it took away my share. Let me uh, reshare this real quick. Let me stop my share and reshare. Let's try this again. And then, there you go. Let's go into this. All right, there we go. Oh, perfect. So where were we? So we were talking about 
what we can do for otosclerosis. So first, you know, we're trying to improve their hearing because this is a hearing problem. So we want to do, um, you know, if it's a bone issue, we want to think about what's going to strengthen our bones. So what's going to strengthen our bones is sodium fluoride. Um, you know, if you think about fluoride, you know, you used to do fluoride to strengthen your teeth. It's the same kind of thing. And then other things that strengthen your bones are vitamin D and calcium carbonate. So um, the, both of these are bone strengtheners. It's going to help us to um, help with that um, bony malformation. Um, what do you call it? Um, a lot of these patients are going to need surgery and there's a laser, laser surgical treatment. They can also have um, a stapedectomy done, um, which is where they go in and they replace that um, abnormal bone. You can kind of see here and allow for actual movement in, um, in that uh, bony process to allow for hearing to return. Uh, they also may have a hearing aid, some uh, either along the way or permanently um, if they choose not to have surgery. So post-operative, we're going to do hearing aid education, which I already went over in hearing loss. Um, they may also need medication education um, when it comes to their sodium fluoride, vitamin D, calcium carbonate, that kind of stuff. Um, post-operatively, if they have the stapedectomy, et cetera, um, they keep in mind this is just a hearing problem, otosclerosis, but after surgery, because you're messing in there in that inner ear area, um, they they can have um, some like vertigo and other symptoms. So after the surgery only, you know, just worry about safety and um, those vertigo symptoms. You also want to tell them to uh, teach them to avoid all those things that are going to increase their intra oracle pressure, maybe is yeah, I. AP maybe I would say, but anything that's gonna increase the pressure in here, like coughing, sneezing, straining, lifting and bending. Um, let them know after surgery, their hearing may be worse at first, but it should improve. So Meniere's, um, Meniere's is in your ears. This is an inner ear disease. Um, this is one, remember I talked about some have hearing, some have um, balance issues. This one is hearing and balance. Most of the, the complaints they're going to have are around balance, but they can have hearing issues too. So it usually occurs in about um, age 30 to 60. Um, and it's where you have too much lymph fluid in your ear. And so there's this imbalance of lymph fluid, which um, leads to this rupture of your labyrinth in your ear. And I'm not gonna go deep into ear anatomy because I don't know, and I don't really want to. <laughs> it's not gonna help you on any of your exams to go deep into the patho, but just understand that the problem here is, is that there's too much endolymph going on or fluid. And so what happens is there's this rupture and this rupture, um, since your ear is meant to be your balancing symptom, uh, sorry, your balancing organ, um, it can lead to a lot of symptoms of vertigo. So these patients come in, they complain of an ear fullness, um, they can have fluctuating hearing loss, kind of a general dizziness. And this is not just like, hey, I feel a little dizzy. I'm talking about this is paralyzing where they can't work, they're stuck in bed um, while they're having these, because these are, um, they, these last for, you know, hours to days, and then they they come and go. So like they, they'll, they'll build up this endo lymph, and then it'll get better a little bit, but it'll keep coming back. Um, but this, like I said, it's causes severe disability where they can't work, they can't do the same things they used to be able to do when they're having these Meniere's attacks. Um, to diagnose it, we have to rule out other causes. So we do what's called a glycerol test. And what that does is, is that we give them glycerol. And what glycerol does is it pulls fluid. It's, it's like a diuretic. Um, and it pulls it. It definitely works specifically on the ear. And so if they take glycerol and their symptoms improve, like if they're having an acute attack and their symptoms improve, then it's usually a sign of Meniere's. Um, because if their symptoms improve with the glycerol, it's usually a sign, hey, the fluid is an issue. Um, but um, you know, if it doesn't improve it, then usually that then they're going to be looking for other things that may be leading to the um, vertigo because so many things can cause vertigo you know it can be heart problems it can be um, brain problems and it can be the ear or the balance problems um, so you want to think about when you're thinking about Meniere's, you want to think about this as two separate things. First, you want to think about, okay, when they're having an acute attack, what do I want to do? And then you want to think about, okay, what am I going to do to prevent it? Because remember, these are periods of exacerbations and remissions for this patient. Um, so during acute attacks, they're in this really intense, unsafe state where they're super dizzy, not even like no joke. I can't even describe how dizzy they are. They can barely walk. So we really want to focus on treating their symptoms. So there's all, there's all the antis that I say, and I should, I should change my PowerPoint here to instead of saying benzos to say 
anti-anxiety. Um, but always think of these things after the thought, but it's all the anti. So we want antihistamines, anticholinergics, anti-anxiety, anti-emetics, and anti-inflammatories. Um, so the antihistamines and anticholinergics, um, well, anticholinergics can decrease fluid, kind of dry you up a little bit, but both them and the anticholinergics um, help to decrease um, some of that vertigo, the vertigo symptoms you're going to have. Anti-anxiety, because it can be very overwhelming and uncomfortable the symptoms. So sometimes you just need to chill out. Um, Anti-emetics because nausea often accompanies vertigo and then anti-inflammatories um, to decrease uh, what do you call it, some of the inflammation stuff that's going on. And this patient's going to be on usually very strict bed rest, or if they are going to be able to get up, if they are safe to get up, you have to be there. It is, they have no balance. Um, you're going to tell them to avoid sudden head movements and position changes. And then other things that can trigger it, um, you know, make it worse, like make the vertigo worse. It's going to be like bright lights, flickering lights, fluorescent lights. So avoiding stuff like the TV and stuff is usually really helpful for these patients. So it's time they're laying in bed, um, uh, trying to rest, and you want to provide them with things to help manage their symptoms. Because when they're having an acute attack, there's not a lot that you can do in that moment, um, just aside from treating that um, problem until they get their balance back and providing for safety. It's all about safety. Um, and then, so pretty much we're just trying to keep them comfortable and we want them, um, you know, low stimulation in the room. Um, so then in between attacks, we want to prevent or decrease the amount that they're having. So to prevent attacks, we're going to give things like diuretics. Um, antihistamines can help, calcium channel blockers, and a low sodium diet. So think of things that are going to reduce the amount of fluid that I'm accumulating um, and then help to decrease um, so, some of that imbalance. So in the way that calcium channel blockers and antihistamines help, it, it's deeper. It's, it's not well understood, but they can help to prevent attacks as well. Um, surgically wise, um, there's a variety of options. So like I said, this is very debilitating. So a lot of times patients are going for something more invasive so they can do things like, um, place a shunt, which helps to drain that fluid. Um, if it gets bad enough, they can do more invasive things like they can cut the nerve. Um, now if they cut the nerve, it's literally going to reduce, cut the, um, ability for that patient to hear. Um, so just keep in mind that cutting the nerve is not a, um, like a mild treatment. Um, and, or an ablation or injection of gentamicin is really gonna, it's literally going to kill the function in that ear, but it's going to prevent them from having attacks. Now these might seem extreme, but like I said, this can be debilitating. If you're having these attacks all the time, you can't get out of bed. So some people, even though it leads to hearing loss, they go to the more invasive options, but obviously we stay least invasive first um, in order to um, provide for better outcomes for this patient. All right, last but not least, the third ear disorder is VPPV. So we have otosclerosis, which is hearing only. We have Meniere's, which is uh, mostly vertigo issues, but some hearing issues too. And then we have VPPV, which is just vertigo. So it's just the imbalance issues. And what happens here, here's another fact that you didn't know. I would say between ears and eyes, at least ears have some fun facts. But um, ears um, have crystal, you have crystals in your ears. And they're not crystals that you can get money out of. So don't go around trying to find your crystals or move them around because that's where we get BPPV. What happens is, is that sometimes it's from sudden head movements or, you know, it just happens sometimes for no reason is that you have your ear crystals get out of place and your ear crystals have to stay in place because they help to keep you balanced. When they get into the wrong little cave or cavity in your ear, um, then, um, you know, you lose your balance and you have that constant or feeling of like uh, complete loss. And so I had a student years ago um, and she had this and we were at clinical and she comes up to me and she just looked a little off. I'm like, are you okay? And she's like, yeah, I'm fine. I just can't open my mouth or turn my head side to side. And I was like, what? Like, that doesn't sound okay. And she was in a procedural area. And I'm like, what are you talking about? Like, you know, what's going on? And she's like, I'm okay. I'm just really dizzy. And I was like, well, you need to go like down to the ER. Let's get you down there. And then she's like, no, I'll just drive to this. And I was like, no, 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 you're not driving anywhere. <laughs> so, uh, but yeah, so ended up like, she ended up having to go and um, you get treatment for this as I'm going to get into here in a moment. Um, but yeah, it can happen to, to anyone. So, but it's, it can, feels like a complete loss of balance. There's vertigo symptoms. They can have nausea and those other symptoms. Um, it's really hard to like move. Like that's why she said she had trouble like moving her head. There's no hearing issues here. It's all balanced and their symptoms can kind of come and go as those crystals are moving. Um, the main treatment for this is to treat the symptoms that we need to get those crystals back into place. So this, in this picture here, it kind of shows that what's called an Epley maneuver and it helps to turn the head in a certain way to push those crystals, hopefully back into the right cave or cavity. 
Um, and then they may need some of those medications for vertigo, like I talked about when I talked about Meniere's, like the, all the antis and things like that that are going to help um, with some of those vertigo symptoms. Um, and then in the meantime, just like it is for the many years patients, all about safety. So bed rest until they um, get the crystals back into place and uh, set up a safe environment for this patient. Thank you, Jesus. I am done with this lecture. I love you all, but I am not a fan of ears and eyes. So this is all because I love you. Anyway, hope this helped. See you for the next one.